Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shainka Tasneem. Today I'm presenting my paper, a comparative analysis between experts and local people's perspective on challenges in creating flood resilient housing in Malaysia. As a tropical climate country, Malaysia is subject to catastrophic climate change, change disasters, notably floods. Flood risk and resilience vary among communities because of geography, topography, and socioeconomic factors. Houses near the river, swamp, and lowland regions are vulnerable to floods. These places are prone to flooding when rivers overflow due to severe rainfall and runoff from higher ground. A disastrous floods, enormous losses, and devastation serve as an example of how certain areas lack resilience. Resilience is a system's capacity to manage disturbances while retaining efficiency across social, economic, physical, and environmental domains. It is human nature to become susceptible when their typical daily activities, facilities, and consumption are disrupted due to a disaster. However, the impact of flooding might be weakened by applying suitable strategies before and after the flood. Strategies include prevention, protection, preparedness, emergency response, recovery, and lessons learned. Around 4.8 million people live in flood prone areas in Malaysia. According to Norizon, all study plans have integrated most measures to avoid risk and reduce vulnerability, although measures on disaster preparedness were inadequate. As a result, the main components of Malaysia's development plans at all levels should include flood mitigation measures, which are statutory development plans that direct planning and control decisions and enable local communities to participate in local development agendas. Incorporating disaster resilient features through comprehensive flood risk reduction strategies in development plans has risen to the top of the development priority list owing to the rising flood risk brought on by climate change and development pressures. A house is an enclosure upholding a serene and protective environment. It is designed to be a place or enclosure that suits living and working notions. Even though many laws and norms govern housing provisions in Malaysia, these only apply to official housing developments. Numerous housing units in several states, mainly villages, built without following these laws and standards, have been classified as informal housing. It is therefore not unexpected that many of the flood-affected houses were wiped away. Additionally, several initiatives and programs overseen by responsible organizations fall short of safeguarding the rights of disaster victims. Besides, rapid growth processes produce settlements in floodplains that are challenging to change, especially in expanding metropolitan areas with poor governance. Flood risk management spans several of the sustainable development goals related to water management and resilient infrastructure. Despite not directly falling under any of the 17 SDGs from the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable De Development. Sadly, the majority of housing projects prioritize affordability above sustainable factors. Additionally, developers ignore sustainability considerations in favor of profit. Prior study shows that families in the Ganga Basin invest to raise flint levels and incorporate other flood mitigation measures. Approaches to managing flood risk have changed in recent years to emphasize integrated strategies that include resilience and more sustainable approaches. It accepts that flooding will unavoidably occur and implements methods that help to lessen its effects while enhancing resilience and accelerating recovery procedures. Qualitative research methodology is adopted for this study. Semi-structured in-depth interviews with 18 respondents, including experts from authoritative, professional, and academic backgrounds, as well as local people in Malaysia, are undertaken to comprehend the current challenges in creating flood-resilient housing. The study approach is separated into five stages, beginning with stage one, respondent selection for interviews, stage two interview, stage three data transcribing, stage four data coding, and stage five data analysis. Personal details of the respondents are concealed for ethical reasons. Purpose, purposive sampling was used with respondents chosen based on their experience and involvement in flood disasters. Interviews were conducted in Silangor, Pahang, Malacca, Terengganu, Johor, and Kuala Lumpur. The majority of the interview questions were open-ended, probing and introspective in nature. In addition to these pre-planned interview questions, 
Some spontaneous inquiries were made while speaking with the respondents. Based on recurring themes in the text, the data are coded. As a result, the structure for thematic concepts was created. These are the experts categorized in terms of authority, professional and academic backgrounds, and also the local people in terms of location who were directly or indirectly involved with flood. As for the experts, include uh, officials from Plan Malaysia, DID, Department of Irrigation and Drainage, Flood Management Division, Architect, Urban Planner, Academician, Architect, NGO, Urban Planning Consultant, DID, Department of Irrigation and Drainage, Stormwater Management Division, Flood Committee Member, National Housing Development Company, Constructor, CIDB Malaysia, Self-Help, Flood Resilient Housing Owner, and Community Leader. Local people uh, from various states were interviewed, such as uh, Malacca, Terengganu, Pahang, Johor, Silangor. Now, uh, moving on to the findings, the respondent said they do not want to make any seal trap. They do not want to make any detention pond. They do not want to make a new sewage to accommodate the water. So the excess water just discharged to existing development. Thus, we need to develop the whole thing, not just the new development. Last time, there were trees. The trees absorb the water. However, suddenly they clear everything up. The developer is responsible for this kind of situation. They used to be my client, and I have realized that the developer needs to put in much practical effort to minimize the risk associated with floods. These are some of the photos uh, with the... Uh, recent flash flood occurrences in Malaysia in the year 2023. And then the respondent says, we must educate people to build on stills. The problem is accepting these ideas. However, when it is necessary, we need to do it. We need to convince our community and authority. The main issue is when we talk about the economic aspects of the stilt house, it is always about the increasing cost. The respondent says, the guidelines we have right now do not cover much on flood resilient housing design in Malaysia. In order to build back, we need to look into improving building design. When we want an intervention for flood proof housing, it is best to approach government housing because imposing regulations on the design and everything is easy. However, if a private developer is involved, it can be done, but usually the cost will be higher. The respondent says, Although there are maps for determining the high risk, medium risk, and low risk of flood in Malaysia, it is not accessible to the public and not published by the DID, Department of Irrigation and Drainage. The information is kept confidential. Because if published, it will affect the property market. There will be less demand for properties that locate in flood-prone areas. The respondent says, our great-grandfathers were so brilliant that they built traditional Malay houses as it is more of an adaptive measure to adapt to the environment. So we need to go back to that. We can build modern structures within the logical principle of how we respond to the nature. The respondent says, according to the guideline, on-site detention, underground storage, and rainwater harvesting must be included in any construction built on land less than 5 hectare. On the other hand, development of 5 to 10 hectare is advised to incorporate a dry pond. As for development greater than 10 hectare, a wet pond is recommended for storage. Another significant issue is preparing the construction sector's erosion and sediment control plan. The respondent says there is a map where we can determine which is a high risk, a medium risk, and a low risk area for a flood in Malaysia. However, it is yet to get approval from the government to release it for public viewing because when the flood map is released, it can have negative and positive impacts. It can hurt the existing development. It is contested that the developer only thinks about the economic benefits. For example, if the residential buildings are on stills, there is more protection, but the extra cost is a barrier. That the government may give more subsidies and offer more incentives to reduce cost when flood resilience strategies are widely used. The cost could be reduced normally. The 
the respondent says, everyone likes to buy the houses on steel as it is higher on the ground. However, because of the steel, the construction cost is higher. Therefore, the house on steel is expensive than the house on the ground. Our program is designed by the government. We are the implementer. So the price and all other factors are decided by the government. We implement it based on the government instruction. The respondent says, our neighbor's house is nearby the river. So her house is quite affected as it is a single story house and the flood water enters the house. My neighbor doesn't own the land, so she cannot reconstruct the house and build it on steel or make it double story. The respondent says the factors affecting flood resilient housing design implementation include the authority that failed to adhere to the DID, Department of Irrigation and Drainage, and other concerned departments' recommendations in the planning and approval process for the peak housing or development proposal. This may be due to the pressure from the outside or politics. We can overcome those challenges by strengthening the process, by taking all the relevant departments, example, DID and planning office, seriously. At the approval stage, DID is one of the agencies to review the proposed plan. While at the design stage, others like planners, EIA and SI consultants and CNS engineers must be well-versed in the natural flooding process or problem. Perhaps they had com complied and done their due diligence, but the outside pressure may dampen the whole process. Now, moving on to a case study, which is a flood resilient house in um, Terenganu, which was a highly successful approach in preventing uh, flood damages. There was absolutely no damage at all. So house, the house is on steel with 69 plastic barrels installed, which serves as the, which, uh, serves as the floating platform. Um, according to the owner of the house, vulnerable communities should have access to resources like finance, land, and building materials so that they can construct their own houses. This represents the most critical conditions for building flood resilient houses. I inherited the land, received financial support from my family, and had access to ma building materials, which made Rumar Aktitu a, a reality. It is indispensable to have access to land and land tenure, security, as well as funds and building materials. During the flood, the house was not completed. Electricity and water supply was connected from the old house, the house next door. The cost at that time was estimated uh, to be RM 55,000. After the flood, there were improvements, installation of additional barrels, connection of electricity and water supply and iron poles. After improvements, the total cost was RM 65,000. The estimated construction period was more than three months and this house was built by Mr. A. Bakar Ahmed Alun. So this floating house is suitable for older people, people with wheelchairs, because the indoor surface is even. This means that there's no height or levels to get to the kitchen and bathrooms. This uh, house is uh, really significant and the significance of the contribution of ordinary people to self-housing in Mal Malaysia cannot be overstated, for which Mr. Bakker is an excellent example. In terms of the local perspective, the respondent says, in village, they own the land and they can build according to their wish. However, in town, we have no option. As either we purchase or rent the house, the house is built according to the current trend. The developer cannot be blamed entirely because if you look back on the statistics, the flood in Pekan, Batu Pahat occurred on the following years, 2023, 2006, 2007, 1971. So flood occurred within a long gap. And maybe the developer thinks it is not necessary to build houses elevated as flood didn't occur every year. The respondent says, we don't have funding to elevate the house. However, usually when there's a flood, we don't lose the house, we lose the furniture and car. Lots of damage occurs inside the house and it is also the car that is damaged, that needs to be underlined. So where should we spend our money? I think the village people had to spend a lot of money on repairing the damaged cars. It needs to be thought from a practical point of view on where we spend our money because it is not cheap to rebuild a house. As the masjid cha was elevated five feet above, still it was flooded. It doesn't guarantee that if the houses are elevated, flood water won't be able to enter. This is uh, photos from uh, masjid cha, uh, flats, uh, which occurred in March 2023. As a single story house resident, it is always challenging to survive during flood. During the flood on March 2023 in Kampung Jawa, the water level reached up to the rooftop of our house. We had suffered huge losses as the flood water entered our house and we were forced to move to the evacuation center. 
while people who are staying in a double story house they suffer less less damage however we need to think about our economic condition and it is not easy for us to renovate our house despite receiving aid from government and ngos we still struggle for survival after the flood there is a burden of preparing everything which requires a lot of money therefore we cannot renovate our house make it double story because it is expensive and we cannot afford it the respondent says flood usually happens depending on the heavy rain low lying areas are prone to flooding during heavy rain and houses are flooded in low lying areas so insufficient and in Efficient drainage system led to flooding in specific areas in Alor Gaja. One of my relatives lives in Durian Tungal, where flood occurs every year. But the water level is not that high. Based on my relative experience, the flood lasts for two to three days. People who have experienced severe flood always prepare enough for the flood. But where the flood is not so severe, the people do not take any pre pre preparation. The respondent says, in an area where flood is frequent and intense, houses on stilts are better for protection than houses on the ground. However, I believe it is not necessarily, necessarily the higher construction cost of houses on stilts, but rather the difficulty of movement for elder people or especially able people that might influence the decision of renovating the house on stilts. Every year, flood occurs twice a year in Kampung Temai Hulu Pahang. Most of the people are staying in houses on stilts in Kampung Temai Hulu. Usually, the floodwaters come from the river Sungai Pahang during heavy rainfall and there is an overflow of water from the river. Throughout the flood, the government always helps the local people. There are no big issues. Just supplying the food or resources takes time. Flood occurs at the end of every year during the monsoon season and we always prepare for the flood. We keep emergency food supply within us before the government send the food supply, put our important belongings in higher places and always prepare. If preparation is taken beforehand, the flood risk can be minimized. The respondent says the government promised to clear and update the drainage system and perform regular maintenance. However, actions are pending. The local authority did not do its job. It was just a promise. There needs to be a coordination between people and the local authority. And then this is a comparative analysis between the experts and local people's perspective on challenges in creating flood resilient housing in Malaysia. So there, uh, the experts and local people share some significant similarities, which are one of the major challenges in building a flood resilient housing constructing on stilts is the higher expenses. And then lack of knowledge and awareness of flood resilient design strategies among the people contribute as the vital factor in creating flood resilient housing. Inadequate effort from the responsible authorities hindered the process of implementing flood resilient design strategies. Political interference play a crucial role in the planning and approval process. Lastly, Western-inspired design styles which disregard the climatic condition of Malaysia dominate the architectural scene. There are also additional perspectives from local people, such as movement and accessibility of elderly and spatially able people is an issue when staying in a flood-resilient house, houses on stilts. Communities should have access to resources like finance, land, and low-cost building materials so that they may construct their own flood-resilient houses. It is significant to obtain relevant information from relevant agencies when constructing a house on a steel because sometimes flood water enters even after elevating the house. To avoid unfavorable designs while adopting flood resilient housing, it is essential to engage those who have lived through disastrous flooding. The community and local administration must work together more closely throughout the planning phase. To conclude, this paper focuses on acknowledging the perspectives of experts and local people regarding the challenges in creating flood resilient housing in Malaysia. Limited research is carried out on flood resilient housing. Therefore, interviews with experts and local people are conducted to obtain practical and concealed information. The outcome of this study distills the key barriers by comparing the experts and local people's perspective to obtain a wholesome understanding of the challenges to offer the best possible recommendations in Malaysian context. Findings reveal higher construction and material cost, political interference, lack of knowledge and awareness, inadequate effort from the responsible authorities, and designs disregarding climatic conditions are barriers to creating a flood resilient housing in Malaysia. Thank you very much.